Lord led me to a message that I think is, that I know, is very pertinent for our times. Um, it's very pertinent for our times because so many times when we hear that still small voice in our spirit, in our hearts and souls, we wonder, is that God really? Would God really speak to me? I'm a sinner, I'm nobody, I'm whatever. And so I want to give you a perfect example of that voice and how that beautiful, still, small voice, sometimes it's very loud, sometimes it is a very quiet voice in your soul, in your spirit. But God does communicate to his people, for sure. On September 12, 1992, Jesus appeared to me asking for a great gathering of priests, deacons, lay people from every strata of the church. What, what I saw, I put into words as a Eucharistic conference. He asked for a time of retreat to lift my priests higher to reinforce and enkindle my disciples, my people, the faithful. He instructed me on what to do and also identified people to call on for help. He said to begin by praying and welcome everyone. This was the beginning of the formation of the group, this group. There was one primary request and that request was that a sacrament of reconciliation always be made available because this would be the way he would pour out his abundant blessings and healings. He asked for the chaplet of divine mercy to be, to be prayed regularly. He, <clears throat> he asked, oh, and at that time, of, at the time of that request, I was not familiar with this prayer. He later instructed that I seek spiritual direction. Okay. Have you ever felt, and raise your hands, I'm really curious then, this is my own thing. Have you ever felt such great joy and then at the same time something happens or something in the life at the, almost the same time simultaneously happens and it's like the deepest sorrow to have both things go at one time? Have you ever had that feeling, both joy and sorrow at the same time? Good. Pretty much the, most people. When Jesus appeared to me that day, that beautiful morning on September 12, 1992, and called for this, he gave me, that was in an apparition, he gave me very clearly to see every single step of, I never saw anything like it before, so I, it was massive. And the closest thing or word that I could explain put on it to explain it was a Eucharistic conference. The, the Eucharist was the center of everything. Now, if you haven't been living in a tunnel someplace, you know that next month in July, there will be a week-long conference that has been prepared for the past number of years, like the past three years, that is going to be taking place in Indianapolis. It's massive. And it's so critical to our faith in our times today. We will be going, the sisters and I will be going to that conference. And, and many throughout the archdiocese are, are signed up to go as well, throughout the United States. We'll all be convening in Indianapolis for this massive Eucharistic Congress taking place. Back then, when the Lord revealed that to me, I never heard of a chaplet of, I never heard of a chaplet. I know the rosary, I knew that, but I never heard of a chaplet of divine mercy. I never saw or um, anything about something that was so massive, like this Congress, this conference is what I called it back then. I was, there were many things that the Lord spoke to me, many things that I did not understand that I humanly, in my way, in order not for, how could I say, to blow up? 
It was so massive to see Jesus and for him to be saying what is coming. And he did. He explained things that were coming down the, the pike, so to speak, that were going to be happening. This was starting in 1992. The things that the church was going to be facing and so on. So there were many things that were far beyond my comprehension and literally I put them on a shelf um, because they were, they were too big for my brain, for lack of a better expression. Uh, and in time, over the years, things would come down and I would, have a, I would understand, ah, oh, this is what that means. This is when Jesus said this, this is what it means. That was a time of great euphoria. But not too long after that, I felt like my head was in, and half of my body was in heaven, and the other half of me was hanging somewhere here on earth. Not knowing what I was going to do or how to begin anything, I knew that I knew that somewhere in my spirit it was going to be very difficult to just do what he was asking me to do. Now, first part of that was prophetic, because all these years later it's happening now. Okay, so part of that was prophetic. Back then it was to report that it was part of the testimony um, that would give credence to this ministry that would be formed coming down the road. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Okay. Mm -hmm. A history. It was forming, God was forming a, a history so that the church would have confirmation step by step to know that what was being revealed was truth. Okay. One. When the reality of that Jesus gave me very small steps to take first. And if you've read the book, it's all in there. You know, very go to this priest, this priest, and this priest. And even those small things, going to this priest and that priest and that priest, there were three of them at that time, um, when I actually had to make the appointment, that was really hard. Because I didn't know how to say what God was calling me to say. Walking into their offices was excruciatingly painful because I needed to explain to them that God was calling. God had appeared. Jesus had appeared, asking for a total healing of every strut of the church and the things that he revealed to me that, um, that I needed to say to them. And there were reasons for all of this. Each priest had a significant hand in helping to promote this forward. Some willingly, some not so willingly, but had no choice. Because the things that the Lord revealed, nobody but they knew. And so that's what opened doors initially. Um, how did that start? Well, I never anticipated anything like that. When I was in prayer, just regular prayer, beautiful, regular prayer, not thinking of the next thing or anything, I finished my prayer, I was going, I got up to go back to do what I, my housework, whatever I was doing, and then a massive angel, a voice that was unlike anything I've ever heard in the lifetime, a voice that filled the entire house. I, I don't know how to explain it, but it was the loudest volume, the most commanding volume, without breaking your eardrums. That's how I can explain it. And what was that voice telling me to do? The voice was telling me to continue to pray. That voice wanted me, the voice of that angel, wanted me to remain in that prayerful state because what was about to happen was so far beyond comprehension, so far out of this world, and deserved the reverence of that position of prayer and the mindset of just being focused on God. I can tell you that 30 something years later, I sure didn't know it back then, I was scared out of my mind. I thought I was gonna die. And the angel was telling me, you know, go get ready to die, he didn't say that. But that's what I was thinking. When does this happen? Never. Um, It was a time, for quite a long time, of the things that the Lord was calling me to do that was like, for me, the highest heights of holiness 
and yet the depths of fear at the same time. Because it's the hardest thing to do to go to an official or to other people, your peers, to say, I have seen the Lord. And this is what he's asking. Because either they're going to be supportive or they're going to think that you're nuts. Right? And probably more on the other side of the nuts side. It took me almost six months and a lot of things that happened to give me the courage, mainly a good friend, who when I finally could get my what had happened into words to speak, I spoke them first to a good friend of mine to kind of test it out. You know what I mean? A trusting friend. We were walking in the mall and actually she prompted the conversation that caused me to speak out. And we were talking about our kids' graduation and what preparations we were going to do. And out of the, out of, in the middle of this conversation, she pops out with, ah, you need to see a priest. I just got like, either I'm going nuts or I just heard and speak that you have to see a priest. And that got me. And so we sat down and said, I have to say something. I have to tell you something or I am going to burst. I sat down and I told her and she listened intently and the words that came out of her mouth were just so profound. She just said, Kath, you just got to do it. Just do what he says. Those simple words gave me the strength and the confidence to take the next step and to just go see the priest. And that's a whole nother story. And all of these years later, I thank God that I followed that still small voice. That wasn't small at all, but it was for a reason and a purpose. But through the years of that still small voice that is so crazy wonderful, and so excruciatingly painful at the same time, if you can understand that. At the time he told me, take a caramel apple out to every household in the, in the land and give them my love. It's like, who's going to do that? If you heard the Lord speak that to you, who's going to do that? For sure, people are going to think you've lost it. This would be it. And yet... When I went that night to prayer group, and I'm, I'm just giving you a few things of this crazy wonderful that I'm talking about. When I went to prayer group that night, knowing full well that that would probably be the last day for that prayer group because they were going to get out of here, you're really nuts. And I said to them before a large group, the Lord is asking us to take a caramel apple out to each household in the land and to bring with it his love. You could hear a pin drop. And I was waiting for those tomatoes to start flying or whatever. But this little short person stood up and said, If God said it, we have to do it. And then another person stood up. Helen Morley from the Morley Candy Factory and said, I'll supply all the caramel. And so on and so on and so on and everything just fell into place. Only to find out. Only to find out. All of that work that we did. Not having an answer of why are we going out into the land other than to tell people God loves them. Who would do that? Only to find out that at the last house on the last block, there was a man sitting in a recliner. That had we not gone there that precisely that time, he would not have made it through that night. He had been brought home from the hospital. He had, had been in the hospital in a coma for six months. He was delivered home to his brother's house. His brother was cross-addicted and had a altercation with the handicapped kid across the street and taken to jail. There was no power in the house, nothing. Not even a ketchup or mustard bottle in the refrigerator. 
when we walked into that decrepit, broken down, scary, dark house to see him sitting in that recliner chair, not able to lift a hand, hadn't taken his medication for the past two days because he couldn't get up to get a glass or his medication. If it not had been that we went there that day, that man would have died. And as God's providence would have it, two of our prayer ministers that were present that day passing out caramel apples were nurses that went immediately and ministered to him and did the stuff. And the rest of the servants went out and who got food and who bought whatever to help this man. And the ministry helped him get back on his feet to recover, to bathe him, you name it. Jesus made us go through all those caramel apples for one person. Everybody got a little bit of sweetness, the love of Jesus Christ through that caramel apple. But that man would have not survived had we not gone to his house. He did it for one person. But yet, you have to look at this. It almost sounds insane to say, go out into the land and bring a caramel apple. Why? The caramel apple, he later told me lovingly, very peacefully, the sweetness represents my love for the people. God knows about caramel apples. And it made sense to me when I finally read the diary of St. Faustina to realize that he once gave St. Faustina in war-torn Poland at that time an orange. And she was going to give it to another poor person. And he said, no, I gave it to you. I gave that orange for you. She was sick, tuberculosis and stuff. He wanted her to have vitamin C, I guess. I don't know. But that's what God does. In the small ways and in sometimes very large ways, God calls us to do something. But let us not overlook the importance of that simple friend of mine. You know, she worked, she did whatever, she was a prayerful person. If it wouldn't have been for her to give me the encouragement, Kathy, just got to do it. Do whatever he tells you. That was her mission. In this whole thing of divine mercy, she answered her call. The nurses, the people, the, Mrs. Morley, God rest her soul, and all of the other people that helped out. Today it's you. Today it's you, sitting in the pew. And you go out, whatever you're called, wherever God brings you, you're bringing him. Because obviously if you're here on a Friday afternoon, morning, afternoon, and listening, you're called by God. Your life is a gift to someone else. And you know what? Not everybody liked me. Many people tried to, I can't say many, but a good handful of people over the years tried to tell me, let me do this. I'm, I'm way more educated. I'm financially better set than you, Catherine. I'm, and they were. They were far more educated. I don't know a lot of stuff. They were more beautiful. More educated, more money, more and more and more and more. But God didn't call them. My stupidity <coughs> several times turned it over, saying, yeah, oh, that makes good sense. You do what you do. But God said, no, no, I called you. And that, throughout the years, has given me the courageous fortitude. Courageous fortitude. All of those things and many other things. God let happen so that this place, the Shrine of Divine Mercy here in Michigan, would be here for you when you need it. And it takes a village. It takes all the prayer. It takes all the love of whatever you're called to do in your lifetime. And so many things from a, um, a couple that was moving and had an extra set of wash machine and dryer and somebody else, two, two families were sharing one wash machine, one dryer in a complex, and here comes this extra one. So many things, so many things that has, has given me the courageous fortitude. When I look at myself, I think, yeah, 
I know God is alive because of what he's done at sure me. I sure could not do a shrine. I sure could not do prayer ministry. I sure could not do them sisters either. But by the grace of God, he speaks. Sometimes I hear it. Lots of times I don't. After many years of walking with him, you just know that you know God is speaking, God's moving, just go with what he says. My guideposts are peace or unrest. If I have a check in my spirit, I don't move. If I have peace, I move forward. What gives me peace, what gives me the greatest joy, is when I see people, our prayer ministers, and people praying with people, and their faith is restored, or they are strengthened, or a healing happens, or spiritual healing happens, prayers are answered, whatever the case may be. And sometimes you just need to have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee to relieve those stresses or whatever. And when you're connecting with someone who is a beloved of God, someone who loves God, someone who, if you love God so much, your heart is open to hearing, your heart's open for healing, your heart's open to do whatever God is calling you to do as impossible as it may seem sometimes. And sometimes it's obviously impossible, impossible, that only God can do. My eyes have seen that, and that's where my courage comes from. So I see Christ in his people. And that doesn't mean that we're not sinners. It doesn't mean that we're, you know, we're perfect or anything. We're not. But we have the desire to love him and to follow him little steps at a time. And that's good enough for God. And if that's good enough for God, it's good enough for me. So I do thank you with all of my heart for doing what you do for being part of God's divine mercy in whatever capacity that is, because it speaks to the Lord. Pray for us. Pray for this ministry and every level of it, that more outreach can happen, that more people will come to know the blessedness and the holiness and the love and the mercy, especially the mercy of God, because that helps us to get over our issues. Right? When we know God is a but he's saying, come on, come on. That's game changer, correct? Yeah. So let us get up with great faith and great fortitude and realize the miraculous things that God has done. That from the impossible, yeah, yeah, you, 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 all, all of us, miraculous. God created you. He has a purpose for you, wherever you're at, you just got to do it. God bless you. Pray for us. God bless your families. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you would like prayer for 